Hello again. Hello again. And welcome back for those of you. Put your hand up if you're in any of the other two sessions that we just had. Please put your hands up. Wow. On a beautiful warm day with all this great music out there, you're in here listening to us. Thank you so much. And others who are new, welcome. Um, but you should be here because we're talking about the future of the world and uh, after Ukraine. That's what today is about. We're, gonna, we're discussing today the impact Ukraine is having and will have in all sorts of areas of our life. We had a, a great discussion at the beginning of the day with Lubomir, looking at the, more on a global level, the superpowers at Russia, China. We just had a, a fascinating discussion about Europe, its response to Ukraine, and how this will change Europe going forward. We had some great questions. And for those of you who've just arrived, I'm very keen to involve you in this discussion as well. Uh, so if you want to say something, make a point, ask a question, put your hand up, I'll, keep, I'll get my attention, and when I can, I'll try and come to you. But this isn't just us discussing it. Now, I'm very, I have to say, I am a little bit embarrassed right now because this session we're discussing the, the, what, how the Czech Republic should be responding to what's happening in Ukraine as a, as a leader, as a president of the EU, with two very prominent Czech personalities in front of a Czech audience, and we're doing it in English. Why are we doing it in English, you may ask? It's because these guys speak great English. By the way, I must say to you, uh, Lubomir, and I say, and so we just had Sasha Vondra here as well. If I were watching two former, whoa, if I were watching two former British foreign ministers being able to have a complete discussion in a in a second language, I'd be amazed. It will never happen. It will never happen. They could probably speak four words of French. That's about it. So hands, you know, I, I'm amazed by that. I think it's fantastic. Um, so let me, we're, we're going to talk about the, the uh, uh, Czech Republic's role, particularly, of course, as the new president of the European Union. And that puts your country right at the center of the European and indeed the global response. Am I getting the echo here? Can we turn that echo down? Closer, that's better. Is that better? Thank you. It's my fault. It's, all, it's usually my fault. Um, it's, um, it puts your country right at the center of, of the response to, to, um, to, to what's happening in Ukraine. And of course, as you, you guys all know, these two people on the stage, but let me give you a quick introduction, just for those of you who don't. Uh, we've obviously got Lubomir Zara, I haven't got my glasses on, actually. I've got my glasses on, I can't see a thing at that age. I want to get your, the pronunciation right, is it Lubomir? That's the only reason, Lubomir Zaralek. He's from Ostrava. Who's from Ostrava here? So many of you know him well, probably know him personally. Uh, Lubomir is a former foreign minister. He was foreign minister when Russia went into Crimea. Uh, he was recently minister of culture here. He was an MP for 25 years. He was around way back at the Velvet uh, Revolution, co-founded the Civic Forum here in Ostrava. And uh, he's now very much involved, since he lost his seat, in social democracy across Europe. For those of you who don't know, he's just been elected to the board of the European Progressive Studies, which is a, a group of think tanks. And also he's chairman of the Masaryk Democratic Academy, which is a think tank. And of course, I'm sure you all know Jacob Zanto. I'll just have to read to make sure that I get it right, because I don't want to get it wrong. Who, does anyone recognize Jacob Yanso? Put your hands up if you recognize Jacob from the team. Oh, you all know him, of course. So uh, he's obviously the man from the television, uh, as, as I used to be in England many years ago. Uh, and um, he has reported around the world, as you know, from the Middle East particularly. He's written a couple of books. He's on television. He tells you what's going on in the world. That's what you need to know. Um, before we start... I just, want to, I just want to quickly show you, if I can, the five objectives that the Czech Republic has set for its leadership, its presidency of the European Union. And these five objectives we're going to use as our agenda for the discussion. So let's start with the first one. 
Okay. So that, it's in check up there. So Matt, you can see what it says. Managing the refugee crisis and Ukraine's post-war recovery, energy security, strengthening Europe's defense capabilities and cyberspace security, strategic resilience of the European economy, resilience of democratic institutions. Now, um, we're gonna take those in turn. Of course, except for Ukraine, frankly, you could say that any time. Uh, they're just words, really, aren't they? But the Ukraine thing, of course, is what's so relevant now. And let's start there. So let, let's, let's start our discussion, if we can. Lubomir, can I come to you first? So the first of those is around, obviously, around Ukraine. Specifically looking at it, if you were now Czech foreign minister, president of the European Union, uh, um, what would be, the, in your view, the, che the right thing for the Czech Republic to be doing to leading the way in, in, in response to Ukraine? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, yes, we, we saw these uh, objectives, these uh, first objectives, but it seems to me it, these objectives are clear and uh, uh, it, is, it is something which should be probably important for any country in, in presidency. But I see something which seems to me most important. It's not a matter of bureaucracy or technocratism, technocratism managing, managing of presidency, but something more. It seems to me the most important thing now is to be able to communi communicate with other countries because War in Ukraine is long-term problem. We don't know how long, if, if months or years. And what we, what we need now is to understand our positions and create unity for this long time. And not only between European Union countries. It seems to me that we have to address also other parts of Europe. For example, we have to address Great Britain and uh, countries which are maybe not directly involved in EU decision making. And to create something which will be able to, to which will be able to keep, uh, which we will be able to hold on for months and years. That's why I see the main, the main task to communicate and to learn cooperate, because for Europe the situation is very risky. I can imagine if Europe will stay neutral in this, it will stay, it will not in, in, engage. Then the result could be splitting or marginalization of Europe. In current, we are, we are living in something like period, inter, intermediate period between two important uh, uh, parts of history. And uh, something is uh, ending, and something new is beginning. And it's a challenge for Europe to be part of the new dynamism. And that's why, especially in this time, to be in presidency means to use this chance and to find a way, because it seems to me that also Europe is changing in these days. For me now, all long time we were convinced that uh, Europe is, European Union is uh, directing to create something like federal behemoth in the future, but now we see that Europe is defender of small nations, Baltic states, Czechs, and Poland, also like, I see also Poland like, like small nation vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And it is something totally new. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, now, I, I spoke today uh, about the sphere of influence, like critical notion in these days, and I'm convinced that right now, that is a new task before Europe, to be able to defend, to be this experiment, fascinating experiment of peace after Second World War, and to defend the right of small nations, or and the right for free election, independence, self-determination. It's what we need, and we need Czech Republic to understand this and communicate and cooperate to keep stance in this crossroad in our history. Can I just specifically on the Czech Republic, thank you for keeping your answer short, I appreciate it. Just specifically on the Czech Republic, does the Czech Republic as one of those smaller nations in Europe, have a, and maybe others as well, have a particular role in reminding Europe of that responsibility, or is it just something that is, is happening anyway? We have, special, we have special role in this. I have heard some, sometimes that uh, the reaction in, in Czech Republic is connected with our history 
uh, th that we feel something like possibility to revenge 1868, 1868. And uh, I'm convinced that it's more than this. It's not only revenge for 68. It's, uh, we have to go more in deep and understand that what is at stake is really this role of small ca countries in, 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 in current world. And it, it's interesting that what, what China is now solving vis-a-vis -vis Uyghurs and Taiwan, in Taiwan is it, a little bit similar. It, it's something which, which, is, which goes from the deep of history, this struggle of powers against small countries. And it, it seems to me very characteristic that position of Germany and France is different. These former empires probably has different approach to this problem of sphere of influence. It's our topic to understand that we, that we are not able to accept the spheres of influence for the future, that we, that we, we are really convinced that there is a right of countries and states for free election, for uh, independence and, and self-determination, and we have to keep it. It's, it's not, it's maybe it's accident that now we have presidency, but I am convinced that we have special possibility, a special chance. It's our problem. We are connected with this from the past. We understand, we, we can remember 1948, Yalta, Yalta Treaty, uh, the, and this treaty when it was on one side was, in, it, it was right, they, they were, declaring that, every, not, that in Europe every country has right for self-determination. On the other hand, was secret treaty between, secret, uh, treaty between Churchill and Stalin that uh, uh, Churchill would accept that the European Un Union will be part of the Soviet. Uh, and the same was part of declaration in, fi in, in Helsinki Final Act in 1975. The same was also part of declaration in 1990. Uh, this treaty two, for, two, two and four, this treaty about unification of Germany. Also in this treaty you can find that, that, is, uh, that we have to take into consideration security, security interest of parts. And all these sentences which are connected with this history of old empires in the past, all this is in big contradiction with the right of the nation on free election and independence. That's our stance, we have to know this. Our, our, our understanding is different, that understanding of big powers, because big powers knows very well that if an imperium is, are collapsing, as is now Soviet, that all these stories are really bloody. It was bloody when Britons were leaving Africa and Kenya in the 50s, there were many killings in this time, and the same was in Algiers when France left Algiers when we are living left Vietnam. And that's why I said that our position is irreplaceable, because our position is special. We have to know what is it all about. We know that, we know, we, we, we know this humiliation of 68. We know what does it mean for Ukraine. You, there is a similar humiliation of, humi you, you, I can show many other examples. Uh, we have to be in the front of these countries which know that we have right for self-determination. Thank you, wonderful. Jakob, let me come to you the same. So as a journalist looking at this, Czech's role right now, uh, what, what's your view? Well, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, I'm not a former diplomat, and I will say something as bold as to make sure I will not be a future diplomat. But I think this first point is wrong. Uh, taking care of the refugee crisis, that is the, the one of the biggest goals and, and, and things we need to do and biggest challenges. But before we move to the second part of the point, i.e. the reconstruction after the war, there is one big part missing. This is winning the war. And this war is our war. This is a war of NATO. This is a war of European Union. And we are lucky enough that there is a country big enough to actually fighting the war for itself, but also for ourselves. The Ukrainians are, are fighting again. This is one of those wars where somebody is fighting a civilizational war between just, just what Mr. Zaurak just said, between the, the ideas of the grand schemes of things, between uh, the great spheres of influence. Now there is a country which no longer wants to be in the sphere of influence as agreed by everybody 
in, uh, and West included after the fall of the Soviet Empire. Now, there is a country which is definitely not small. It's actually huge. Last time we spent there reporting just on the south, uh, on the southern line, within three weeks we drove 6,000 kilometers. That's, that's how big, and that's a small part of Ukraine. That's how big Ukraine is. But what we need to concentrate on is to help Ukraine to win the war, because again, as I need to, I think you know, that this needs to be stated again, the Ukrainians fighting the war for, for, of survival, yes, but also they're fighting a civilizational and big scheme war for the West. Okay. So, so, so uh, Czech Republic's role in that is, as Mr. Zarel just said, unique as is uh, the point of view of the small, as we say, because there's, there are even countries even smaller than us, the Baltic states, and some, some countries which are middle-sized as Poland because we have this unique history of actually being in between the changing lines of the spheres of influence of big empires. We don't want that. And we understand how important it is for countries that no, no longer want to be a part of somebody, someone else's game to be able to choose. Okay, so um, you, you can keep, the Czech Republic can keep people being aware of that. Um, do you think the EU, the European Union, of which the Czech Republic is now president, uh, what role does it have to play in this situation? Well, uh, I will add a non-academic uh, ground, and I'll use nice American expression, grunts, grunts experience from, from the field, from terrain. Uh, it's, it's simple. Uh, on one side, you have a power which, in a war which is completely black and white, uh, is using between 50 to 60,000 rounds of ammunition every day. The country that we're supporting is able to fight, uh, to fight again, to fight back with five to 6,000 rounds. One, one Ukrainian uh, piece of ammunition against 10 of, of, of Russians. Uh, the game is pretty easy. If you have uh, a, a piece of artillery that is run by Russian soldiers, uh, let's say from my position, I'm able to fire against your position. So we need to help Ukrainians to have something that fires at least the same, di this, the same distance. That's how wars are fought. I shoot against you, you are able to shoot against me. Now the Ukrainians, they're actually able to shoot from here which means that for the Russians it's much easier to fight and it's much easier to do the terrible atrocities that they, that they showed against the whole world that they don't care about civilians. And actually they do care about Ukrainian civilians as about aims. There is this, I think that nobody will be able to forget for a long time the little four-year-old girl Lisa that, was, that, that, that suffered from, from, uh, from all kinds of illnesses and Down syndrome among them that was killed with her mother in the center of Vinitsa, which is a, a middle-sized Ukrainian town in the middle of Ukraine, which is really far from the front line. That's what they are doing. There was not a single military, military uh, 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 target that they could actually fire again. They are just terrorizing the people. This is the kind of war the Ukrainians are trying to defend from. Now our, uh, what we need to do is to help them do that, that is, Ammunition, Czech Republic can do that. That is pieces of weaponry. Well, we, we have now already given, I think, as much as not being able to fight a war ourselves, but we're, you know, we're lucky enough to have our friends from NATO all around us that so we can give. And, uh, and, and we, need to, we need to remind everybody in, the, let's say, in Germany. Uh, we need to remind everybody in Italy, in Portugal, in, in Greece, in, in Spain, which are, you know, that the countries that have been reluctant at the beginning, what kind of war is, is happening? It's not something in, in the East. We could, you know, we could forget about the war in Syria because it was too complicated, too far away. Well, it's not, it was not so far away as we learned in 2015. Now there is something that is happening, and now we are talking about, uh, and about talking about six, seven million refugees of people who share our culture, ancestry, who are the part of our civilization. And they need our help, which is the part of the first part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, part, first part of this first, first point. But again, we need to help them to be able to come back. That is stopping the war. The war does not, cannot stop 
as it did between 2014 and the beginning of this year. I'm interested in that last point you made about the, the we, we were, in the discussion we just had about Europe, one of the points that came up in the session just now was the question of whether the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, obviously like the Czech Republic and others, feel this more strongly, uh, uh, take this, what's happening in Ukraine, even more to heart than my country, for example, which is the other side of Europe, or, or, although we, I'd say Britain's actually been pretty good, but the French, the Italians, and even the Germans who are, are using big words but not doing very much. What was your view about what can the Czech Republic, as a former Warsaw Pact country, do? Do you think to, as it were, drag some of those countries uh, to, to 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 do more? Well, yeah, it's true that uh, the this uh, position and approaches are different. There are different uh, in the current world. There are different in Europe, and. Uh, Maybe I, I read an article in the New York Times from, from Doug Hutt when he said, from the US, we delivered 40 billion of dollars. It's enough. Now it is the role of our European partners to, we, we can transfer this task to Europe. Now it is their task to, to help. We made enough. Because it's totally clear that uh, from US approach, U.S. approach is different as European generally, and uh, I can't imagine what will happen during a f during months when we will be close and close to election. Not only midterm election, but also presidential election. When I can imagine that it could be president candidates in U.S., which will start with a proclamation: "I am ready to stop the war in Ukraine and to make deal to strike deal with the Russians." It could be. That's why. The, and, and the, the differences could be uh, broader in, in short time. And the same, it, it's not only Europe and US. It's maybe important also to say that there are differences also in the whole world. And if you, if you will start to, to, to read, for example, Indian newspapers, you will be surprised. I had, had a student in, in, from Cameroon I, 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 in, 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 in university and I asked him, how it looks you in, in, in Cameroon? He told me, ah, in Cameroon we have the, the, main, uh, the, the main subsidies and money from Russia and China. We have totally different approach to, to Ukraine than he, you, you in, in, in Ukraine. It's Africa. And I can, I can continue that uh, maybe the more than the half of a year, half of the world and population has different and more neutral and more different position than we in Europe. And that, that's, it's not only about communication and cooperation in Europe, but it, it seems to me very important because I'm afraid that we are facing long-term crisis to be able also to address the other parts and other continents. And, but the prerequisite is to be able to create position here in Europe, and that's why what is, what is this, this special role of countries like Czech Republic, and it was your question, because to be able to help to create this clear position of Europe for the, and, and to create alliance in Europe, which will be sustainable for a long time. And uh, th that's why it seems to me that it's a big task for diplomacy in these days, big task also for Czech diplomacy, for European diplomacy. I'm convinced that Every war is a uh, uh, failure of diplomacy, and, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it has no sense only to repeat this. I'm, I'm afraid that we are facing the decline of diplomacy in the current world from our side, and that is a challenge to change this. Okay. Now we have to use all what we can to change. I do, I'm only interrupting you because we've got a lot to get through. Very briefly, though, What's different now? You were foreign minister when Russia went into the Crimea. And uh, Europe, the Czech Republic, did not respond as it has done now when that happened, which was already a br broke, foreign, broke uh, international law, you know, many of the same issues. The first the, Ukrainian war. Yeah, eight years ago. So wh why, did, why did your government and the West generally, Europe generally, not respond as tough then as we are responding now, what's changed? No, I don't know if we did not respond tough because I remember 
that in these days I said uh, publicly, openly, that uh, what is happening in Ukraine is the same story that we knew from 1938 and 1939. And uh, I am convinced that our position was, was, was clear. We condemned this uh, uh, and uh, we support uh, any steps, uh, uh, any steps uh, to, uh, to stop this. Uh, and uh, I'm convinced also in this time, it was our countries which uh, tried to, uh, uh, to strengthen the position and to unite the position of Europe. Also in this time, it was not so easy because uh, uh, for some parts of Europe, there was no so much interest to devote time and energy to Ukrainian problem. I remember very well that uh, for some months, it was nearly difficult to uh, put it on agenda of the European uh, minister. Maybe it's surprising, but it's, it's true. Because for France and Italy and Spain, it was much more important to speak about uh, Africa and Mediterranean, Mediterranean. They were convinced that the problem of migrants and terrorism is much more important than the problem of Ukraine. What's changed? What's changed now? Why is it so different now, in your view? It's the same thing, they've just gone further. What's no, changed? something changed because uh, uh, now it's clear that uh, it's the first time after Second World War when we are facing open war, which is also very similar what we, uh, in, in, in method what we saw during Second World War. And uh, as uh, uh, Jakub Santo said, uh, the intensity of artillery, 50,000 of grenades per day, it's, uh, uh, it's, amount, this amount is, it, it's amount of production of uh, artillery grenades for, for one, two months in our, in our factories, yes. It's, the intensity is unbelievable of this fight and, and this, and this, and this. And we are not able to support, maybe sometimes there are, there are rumors that we are not willing to support, but the problem is that we are not able to produce so much grenades in, in, because it's, uh, if, if, you, if you want to help, you need aluminium, you need steel, but uh, uh, all the time we were uh, buying steel from, from Russia and from Ukraine. It's, 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 not, it's not easy to produce, uh, to produce uh, so much munition and equipment for, for Ukraine. And th that's why the intensity of this conflict is unimaginable. At, also, and in comparison with uh, the first the Ukrainian first war. Just that's why now it's clear that we are facing something absolutely. And also, it's, it, it's clear that it's not only about Ukraine. It seems generally, probably, it's, it's not so difficult to show that it is a uh, war, which is probably also proxy war, in which uh, uh, we are facing the geopolitical challenge, and then Europe, the whole Europe is at stake. Because now it's not clear what will be the result. We, after the first, first World War, uh, Austria was broken, Russia was broken, Soviet Union arose, everything changed. And now we are on the beginning of war, with Dynamism of war is surprising and, and unpredictable, and that's why also Europe is at stake. And now it's much more easy that, than it was uh, in 2014 to explain that uh, uh, the result of this war would be also that also Europe could completely change. If it will be not able to be united and elaborate common strategy, then we could be very surprised. Okay. Uh, Jakob, let me turn to you. Uh, we could get into that discussion and spend the rest of the time here, but I'm, I want to involve you guys as well, so I'm going to stand up because I'm going to bring you in. But Jakob, I want to ask you a question about the second part of that strategy, which is the refugee crisis. It, you made the point. They're talking about after the war. The war, when is after the war? We don't know when that will be. The refugee crisis is now already. You've got 400,000 Ukrainians have come to the Czech Republic, 40,000 kids, new kids in the schools here. Poland has got issues, you know, everywhere's got suddenly. Can you talk through your views on that? How will, how will that play out for people, as far as you're concerned? Well, it's hard to keep up with, with the numbers because, well, people, uh, Ukrainians understood, and now we're facing actually a wave of refugees which is completely different from the one in 2015. First, this, we first at least here understand this is our war. 
that one was not. It was a distant war, right? Uh, so uh, second is also demographics. Now, 90% of all the people running away from Ukraine are not young men with iPhones, to quote the very nice uh, uh, misunderstanding of many of, of, of our journalistic colleagues, who had iPhones because they bought the iPhone with the money they were given by their family, the Syrians, and why so many young men? Because they were depend, uh, they, 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 they did not, they were not needed for the survival of the family, so that's why the youngest uh, unmarried, I'm sorry, the, the, the oldest unmarried son was sent to Europe to, 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 to look for sort of a place so, and then gain money for the rest of the family. That was the idea where so many young men. Now we're facing complete, something completely different, which is much easier for us to be sympathetic. It's women, children, and elderly people. So I think the, the sympathy is completely different. Now, it, it was so easy for a, <laughs> for a geopolitics expert uh, drinking a beer uh, in 2000, 2015 next next door uh, drinking Ostravar or uh, or something sorry better and uh, and drinking drinking beer I, I will be killed for that I know sorry but uh, <laughs> drinking sipping beer and saying you know why the hell that guy is not fighting his, his own war well you know what he was fighting the war but in a different way now we don't have that because well you know ladies and children and elderly people are not fighting the war their sons their brothers their uncles and their fathers are. So uh, I think the sympathy will be easier uh, to stay on the very high level that, 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 that it is still right now here. Second reason for that is already prior to the war, we had had 250,000 Ukrainian diaspora, by far the biggest minority in Czech Republic. Everybody knows a guy who works at a construction, everybody knows a doctor who's Ukrainian, everybody knows a lady uh, that works in the, at, a local, uh, at a local shop or, or helps your, uh, your, uh, your apartment tidy. Uh, so, uh, and, and then, you know, second, and you know, be, let's be open and frank about it. Those people are white and they're Christian. That makes it much easier that if you're darker and a Muslim, so that's why I think, you know, again, the, the level of sympathy, which is very high in this society, in Poland, in Baltics, and hopefully also westwards to, towards European Union, will stay very high because we will need to help those people for years to come. They will want to go back. We are now talking about, about families that are broken in half. They want to go back, but you know, we don't know again, as we said with the first point of the, of the, of the, of the Czech presidency, we don't know where the war, when and where and how the war will end. It's quite clear that Ukraine is not able to fulfill its own openly defined uh, aims in this war, which is to kick out the Russians from the rest of Ukraine territory, Crimea, and the, 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 the starting point of the occupied Donbass included. There's no way they can do that. Unfortunate, I have to say, frankly, and, and openly. So, so we need to, 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 to understand that there will be difficulties. 40,000 kids, and my, I think it will be more, I think it, according to the information I have, 50,000 kids, we are a nation of 10 million, 50,000 kids, and being concentrated mostly in bigger cities will be a burden. We need to find, uh, uh, we need to help the ladies, their mothers, to be able to, to, to sustain their families, uh, not just uh, by helping us to tidy our apartments, but to do what they're, what they're capable to do that, uh, to do. We have so many Ukrainian kids, we will need Ukrainian teachers. If there's a Ukrainian lady who's a teacher, it's better for her not to clean our apartment, but to actually teach and help teach the kids. Etc. Etc. And uh, and those are things that will cost, uh, let's say, the public sympathy level. Somehow it will. Uh, there may be uh, other uh, middle-term problems. Uh, uh, there will uh, maybe will be a, a, another increase in the in the prices of uh, of living. But those are things that we need to be ready for because we need to help. Media, politicians, NGO sector, we need to help uh, the Czech society and Poles, etc., to keep the high level of sympathy because this will be needed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come, uh, Ludmila, I'm definitely going to come to you on this. Uh, for the, anyone that wasn't at the beginning, with the, yeah, I'm going to come to this lady here, if we can give her a mic, but for anyone that was uh, at the very beginning of today when I did my opening discussion, I, I asked anyone in the room who had Ukrainian 
Ukrainians staying with them here. In the, and two people spoke about how they've been welcoming Ukrainians into their lives here. As I know, I can speak in Britain, there have been many, many, many people who've done the same. And the other thought, I just want to remind everyone, uh, which I should have done when you mentioned it earlier, I just think it's really important for us to remember, uh, the, the, the attack on Venetia uh, this week, where all these innocent people were killed with cruise missiles, is a thousand kilometers away from here, I checked. A thousand kilometers, six hour drive from here. 500 kilometers away is the Ukrainian border. I mean, we're, we're really close, as you all know, but it's just worth remembering. Yeah, I'm very keen to hear, particularly from women in the audience, because we're all guys, we want to hear from some women. So the lady here, uh, have you got the microphone? Great, but ask, ask, and if you want to speak in Czech, because these guys speak Czech, feel free, if you're more comfortable, feel free to do so. But speak in English if you can. Oh, yeah. Yeah, take mine. Take mine. Thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, for the previous question. Um, I wonder, uh, Mr. Sando, your um, experience from the field in Ukraine. I feel that this whole conversation is held on um, uh, is regarding a lot the political level and the political solution of this whole situation. And I was thinking um, if you have any other opinion or experience or, or, uh, or view from the, from the people in Ukraine who are fighting the war at this moment, if they feel this as a matter of political solution, uh, of, of a political approach to the solution, because I think that we a lot we see the position of European Union Union, which I think is very important, and we also think a lot about the our history, which I don't want to suppress at all. But I would like to know more about the national um, the national um, interest of the Ukrainian people and how do they see. The, the approach to the, the solution. The, yeah. the approach here. Uh, to the, uh, I, well, I just want to say one thing. We had a discussion earlier today about very much about the human level. We made the point we are discussing the politics of things today, the solution. So we, that's what we are. I, want, I don't want to spend too, too much time, however important that is, yeah. uh, but I do want to talk about the politics. So, uh, but your question is, is, is a good one. Let me, let's stick to the politics. Yeah. Thank you. Before we come to that, any other question. We talked about the refugees, about Ukraine. Yeah, there's a lady down here. And if you prefer to speak in Czech, if you're more comfortable, do so. But if you can speak English, that's great. I don't want you to feel you can't express yourself. Shall I but, ask the question? Yes, now? please. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zawadal, like you compared um, the Russian aggression to the World War II. And I wonder, is there any chance that in the future we will have as amicable relationship with Russia as we have nowadays with Germany, despite the horrors of the World War II. Thank great, you. Great, great question. Thank you. So let's take those two questions in turn. First of all, a question to you about the human. I'm, I'm, the way I'm going to phrase that, because of the discussion, are they called? What are they saying we should be doing, and you know what the Czech countries like the Czech Republic should be doing to solve their problem? Well, uh, let's remind ourselves that the Ukrainian nation living within the pre-war, pre-2014 war, the population is 44 million people, right? We are 10 million people and sometimes it's really hard to agree at, one, at the same table, right? So, so it's really hard. Uh, it's been said over and over again because it looks nice, especially in Western European media, that the greatest unifier of the West and East of Ukraine is Mr. Vladimir Putin. Right? It's not, it's not, it looks nice on the paper. It's not true. It's, it's, it will take time. We are not talking uh, about Russians living in the east of Ukraine. We are talking about forcefully Russified Ukrainians speaking Russian, okay, as a result of five really, really, uh, five, five centuries of really systematic Russification. But those people have been Russified really, really hard, not just in, not just in the east, not just in the, in, in the Donbass, Odessa in the south, which considers sometimes itself as a special part of Ukraine, uh, is mostly Russian speaking. People in Kharkov, Kharkiv, are most of them, well, at least more, more than half, are talking at home in Russian. They consider themselves Ukrainians, but now the people in the East are refugees. Now they are being liberated by the great Russian Federation army against the, the West 
uh, uh, the Western uh, Ukrainian Nazis who tried to kill them off. Now, the people who actually live in Lviv, they say, we, we've told you so. We've been telling you that for centuries, that you're stupid and stupid and stupid. Why the hell, as Ukrainians, do you speak Russian? You're Ukrainians. And those people, when they are in Lviv, they're ashamed because they need the help of the people. It doesn't make, it doesn't make them love them, right? When you owe somebody something, you don't love the person. That's the problem. So the, the problems, you know, the, 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 the difference between what people in the East, in the West, and in the South will, will, will be telling vis-a-vis -vis the, the way the, the, the war is led is really different. So back to your question, everybody is very happy that the world cares. That's why they were so happy about things that have nothing to do with the war, i.e. when the Ukrainian ban won the stupidest international song competition in the world, i.e. the Eurovision. I think I'll be kicked out from Czech television as well, eventually after this discussion. <laughs> but, but those are symbols that are very, very important. For them, you know, for the morale is as important as uh, 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 Volodymyr Zelensky talking directly to, to different politicians, etc. Because this is so important for the morale. On the other hand, of course, the media that are shaping, helping shaping, uh, to, to shape the, the, the whole idea. It's hard now, now to talk about uh, objective media at the, at, the, at a nation that is under 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 uh, you know a brutal attack uh, uh, so so the numbers of the Russian casualties and uh, and uh, how many thousands of tanks they lost etc that are published every day in Ukraine media uh, well let's talk about that with a grain well more than a grain of salt because this is important but you know that's you know you don't you don't work with that so again the media are a part of let's say a white propaganda but they are it's hard now to talk about uh, so many mistakes that Zelensky uh, had done prior to the war, uh, which was an open topic. Now it's not so much. And then there, there are things that are suppressing, let's say, the, the political freedom, uh, i.e. The, 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 uh, the, the closing of the, of the Ukraine Communist Party, uh, which again, you know, to my, according to my opinion, it should have been done long ago, but that's a different case. So back again to your, to, to your, uh, to your question. They're very happy that they have the world on their side, and then how much the world will, 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 will help them, that remains on the end of the war, or the outcome of the war. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you, Lubmi. You've got a yeah. lot to respond to there, including the last question about Russia, so go ahead. Yeah, the question was German and Russian, and what will be the future, our future with Russia? Uh, I remember my grandmother. My grandmother was not willing to listen German language because of experience with the brutality of Nazi regime during the time of occupation. And uh, I know, maybe also you know similar people which had this terrible experience and uh, were not able to forgive and to forget. But at the same time, I can tell you I've experienced different experiences than my grandmother. I met Frank Walter Steinmeier and Angela Merkel, people Deep Democrats, I believe them. It seems to me a chance. Also, it was also for 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 Europe, this representation of Germany and the former and and, and current, and uh, the same with Russia. I don't believe in uh, on essentially evil. It seems to me is nonsense, because the history. I would like to show you one very surprising similarity. When I take this declaration of Nazi regime in the 30s. What are the main topics of Hitler and his guys? Tip war, uh, to, uh, disdain, deep disdain to world international order, international rules, disdain to small countries, and feel they are endangered by this whole country. It's nonsense. Yes, Hitler endangered Germany, endangered by Czechoslovakia, and now uh, Putin endangered by Ukraine and so. It's, it is, it's very similar. It seems that there is a similar model and similar attack. And uh, it is what I spoke about, this sphere of influence. But uh, I'm convinced that uh, the, what is happening now and current Russia representation is no uh, something like a show of uh, uh, display of some typical Russian character, not. It is the result of concrete situation. It, as it was in German case, this deep feeling of humiliation for Versailles Treaty and uh, Weimar Republic. 
The similar story you can see in Russia. After 1991, uh, Russia lost, uh, lost territory, uh, lost territory, and uh, uh, now it turned out to be on the level of 18th century. Yes, it was something unbelievable. And I can imagine also this feeling of humiliation of Russia, it lost everything. And political elites in, in this time used this feeling and create the legend of treasury and the West, uh, hypocrisy and all this. So I create this story. And that's also really similar, it, it means there are no essential evil in nations, but the, the, there are situations which are utilized in similar way. And that's why I believe that, as I said, we have to fight, we have to fight, we have to help, but I am afraid people, but I can't believe that we are able to win this war. Even in the case that we will, we will defeat Moscow and so, I'm, I'm afraid, but it seems to me unrealistic. We have, to, we have to do what we can, what seems to be very important. Ukraine has to have access to Black Sea, because you know that if we will lose this access, it, it would mean it, it totally change the position of Ukraine. We have, to, we have to fight to create the best possible position for negotiation. But there is no other option than to find compromise. I don't know how long it will take. It could be long, I'm afraid. It's very risky. There are many risks of escalation. But I am afraid that uh, maybe this, uh, hasten, this, uh, this hasten war from the side will, be, will mean the demise of, of uh, this regime. Maybe, I don't know. But it's not so probable. But also, if Putin will be demised, and then I'm afraid that this bitterness which is uh, part of the atmosphere in Russia, will stay. It means that we will need to handle with this long time, and probably it took gener it take generations, maybe for Russia, to accept that they lost this imperium. But uh, it's, as I said, this uh, history is always in history, is very bloody and very difficult. We have to handle with this. That's why we need allies. We need allies not only in Europe, we need allies also in the world to, to elaborate and to handle the, this crisis, which is deep, and I feel sorry long, but I am, if I am, but I'm convinced that on the, the, the very important is what kind of meal, what kind of peace we are preparing. And if we are fighting war, we have to know also, we have, it's, it's something which is much more difficult that maybe win the war is uh, to create enduring peace. Me, it's, gonna... It also has to be, and also Russia will be, also after, after this war, Russia will be part of this world. We have to find a way how to cooperate with this yeah. future Russia. Thank you. Actually, what I'd really like to know, can we get the microphone back to the lady who asked the question, young lady who asked the question. You're, you're a totally new generation. What do you think is the answer to your question? Could you now imagine as a young woman a future where you'll be friends, you know, where your country will be friends with Russia? What do you think? Well, f for a while I was studying in Miami and I met a lot of Russian people who come to U.S and learn the language and learn the new culture, the Western culture. And um, in some cases, I felt like they hated us for hating them, if you understand. So I think we need to start with ourselves and stop, as you said, humiliating every Russian person, because I believe that not every Russian person is a bad person trying to conquer the world. But I also think that unless the Russians get um, objective information and just stop feeding on the propaganda that they are served every day, um, we won't be able to find a compromise and amicable relationship. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, the polls are showing that there's, the support in Russia is going down as it happens, but that's another story. Um, by the way, if any journalist in the room, there is one. You know, former foreign minister says we can't win the war. There's, a, there's an angle, surely, from today. Um, uh, we, we've only done the first of these. Uh, we've only got uh, 10 minutes left. We've only done the first of these five objectives, but it's the big one, so that's okay. I, I want to go to number five, actually, if I may, because I think this is interesting. Uh, the rest of them, you know, what we call in English motherhood and apple pie. We want the world to be a better place. But the... 
But the, the, the democratic, what's the threat to democratic institutions right now that the Czech Republic is seeing, Jakob, that it feels it needs to defend against given what's going on in the world? Did you want to talk about that? Well, it's, it's connected to the uh, security, and the, the cyber security, uh, uh, all the, the troll farms, all the, all the hysteria that's been fed after 2014, 2015. Prior to that, that actually it was almost non-existent. Uh, 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 propaganda, uh, uh, trying to mix up the ideas, because we know we've finally woken up a little, understanding that Chinese and Russian propaganda, and all other propagandas, of course, there's all kinds of propagandas, but the ones that are from these two countries directed against us is not to win us over on their side. They understand that there's not going to happen. They just want to confuse us. They want us to fight over uh, woke culture, cancel culture, and all that, because that suits everybody, well, their, their, their interest. Now, then you can see the, the results of the elections. And I have to say, and I'm, I'm sorry, I need to react to what you said, and I, and I appreciate it, but I'll be much more hawkish than you are. I'll spend four years of my life as a kid in Soviet Union uh, during Gorbachev era between 86 and 1990. Uh, uh, I am certainly not, not a Russophobe. I speak fluent Russian. I, I'm a big admirer of Russian culture, and I never blamed a single Russian person. And I think that this hype about, uh, about Russophobia is actually does not translate into individual people. Uh, it translates into waking up of uh, 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 an aggressive, aggressive uh, would-be empire, would-be again empire, that is actually threatening us I do not hate Russians every day. I do not hate Russia, and I don't think either of you do. It's actually, you know, your checks are, uh, you know, the joke about the guy from Brno talking to the guy from Prague, and he says, you know, what we talk, what would we say about you guys in 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 Brno? That you guys in, in in Prague, you have no sense of humor. You're way too down to business. You you know, you want your money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the guy from from Prague says, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. You know what we say about you guys from Brno? What would you say? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> right? It's a sorry about. Uh, it could be any other uh, city again. Anyone from Brno? No, sorry. Okay, but no, what I want to say: How much time did you spend before the beginning of this war talking about Russia, humiliating Russia, hating Russia? You, I believe you didn't. It's not there. It's their complex of inferiority, which is which has been part, unfortunately, in Russian culture since the first time Peter the Great decided that he wants to make uh, Russia part of Europe. Yeah, yeah, cool. can I just interrupt you briefly because of time? Quick, very quickly on this, though. Does that survive Putin? Is this just about Putin? If Putin goes, everything's okay? No. In the way that Hitler went and everything no. was okay? No. It's not. It, so you think it's more fundamental than that? No, it's more fundamental. Russia and Japan they turned out to be the peace-loving nations after the huge, terrible defeat that they, that they received in 1945. That's why, and I'm, I, I don't want Russia to go through that. I'm saying if Putin goes, somebody else, somebody else will come. Maybe even worse, I have no idea. But Russia will not be defeated to the way that Ukrainian soldiers will be marching on the red, on the, on the, on the red square, i.e. the same total change, 180%, 180%, uh, sorry, degrees, that happened after 1945 in Germany and Japan will not happen in Russia. Whatever. And Lubomir, do you have a view on that? I, 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 I remember, I, I, I remember one, one, one. Uh, uh, memory which I have. I, I had a few times I had opportunity to visit North Korea. Uh, what was interesting uh, that the big part of this discussion with the North Korea representative was about the United States. They were totally uh, fascinated by the United States and all the time speak about uh, the main enemy and the danger and so. And one time I told them, uh, I would like to inform you that uh, I'm convinced that the United States they are not so much devoted time and energy to your country. It's not that the US are, in US they are uh, in the morning starting to sing about you and, uh, and uh, finishing day also to thinking about North Korea. I, I was surprised it was really something like the, 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 the best possible offense for them to say them that US are not engaging or not uh, interesting in, in North Korea. I, I, I feel sorry, I, I was, I'm a little bit horrified when I, when I see similar tendencies also in Russia. Yes, it is something like, uh, they are, it is something like illness, yes. And, but on the other hand, I have, to I have to keep what I said. I'm convinced there is no essence, essential evil. And uh, I feel very sorry that so many uh, people and Russians left Russia 
I, I'm afraid there are hundreds of thousands of Russians which left. It's not only now, also, also Nabokov and many other Russians left Russia in the, in the past. And it's a tragedy of this country that they are losing all this. Uh, uh, and I, I, I feel sorry, what seems to me very dangerous is that we know that uh, Putin from some point, from some time, was decided to leave, to let these people leave. And uh, uh, because he was convinced that he don't need these people in the country, and it'd be better to stay only with, with the country which are better to man manipulate. Yes, it's a terrible story, but I am, I am convinced that it is not so different from this German story which we remember from, from this uh, from 10, 10, 20th century. And that we can't say that Russia is uh, eternal enemy. And uh, I, the, 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 this uh, process, of collapse of imperial will be long, uh, probably very difficult, but uh, we, have to, we have to learn how to handle this process, how, how to handle with the Russians. And it's our task to elaborate strategy and, and to be able to elaborate here in Europe together, uh, because it's important for us. I'm afraid if we'll be not able to understand that is one of the crucial tasks in our time, then it could be big danger for us that we will lose. In thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, fascinating. By the way, as, as a Lund someone who lives in, lived in London many years, the only Ru I saw a lot of Russians in London. There were a lot of Russians in London. And we didn't, I don't think we saw the good Russians in London. Let me put it that way. They were, we had a particular view there. But that was an unfortunate way to view a country. I, I'd li again, I'd like to invite anyone who's got questions or comments or thoughts that they want to share. Yeah, there's a young lady there. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a question for Mr. Santo. Um, you have extensive experience reporting from the Middle East, and you know how um, the, mm, the actions of the, and the perspectives of the media can then shape the perspectives sort of worldwide, especially in Europe. And so I was thinking, what do you think is the role of European media in shaping uh, Europe's response towards um, in the war in Ukraine? The, the goal of, did you say the goal of Europe? What is media? the role? The role, I beg your pardon, thank you, the role. Before we, I'll, I'll put that to you, but before we do, Jakob, is there any other question I can take from, there's a, there's a, sorry, there's a lady just at the back there I've just spotted. Was there someone over here who said that one? That, okay, I'll come to you in a moment if I may. Let me just get this lady as quickly as we can with a white T-shirt. Can you just pass, yeah. We've been ambushed by the Russian bots. The Russian bots have got to yeah, our microphones. No, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the thoughts. We were also discussing the Czech Republic and the way forward or the role in there. And we have now six months as a president of the European Union to just pull through all these five points. Uh, but we are also in the time that there are two elections coming, one in the autumn for the regional boards, let's say, and then the presidential election. Maybe the question to Mr. Zauralek and Mr. Santo, um, how they think that these elections could shape the populist thoughts from our politicians to influence the elections and the prop propaganda before that. That's because because there's like a general now really nice points the handling the refugee crisis but closer to the elections maybe there will be a shift to populist thoughts to get other parties which are not now in the in the power thank you i'm just aware of time. i'm so sorry i'm not going to have time to i do apologize we've got, we're running out of time and i want to get the answers thank you so let's go with the first one we've got short if you could role of the europe of media the role of european media as it as as a role in in every media in the world is not to shape anything. We are here to, 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 to transfer the truth around me to you, right? I'm not there. I can think about my role of that something is happening, but my role is not to shape anything. My role is to report, and I hope to, 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 to do that by also not calling the conflict a Ukrainian war, which is so many times the case, but the Russian war. This is a Russian war against Ukraine. So this, I think, in, in thinking about what might, might shape the debate is this. We just need to report. We do not need to shape anything. Isn't that the point, though? Whatever words you choose shapes perception. Sure. And so you don't have a neutral role. You'll report, you know, you, the way you frame it, 
the, the, the thing you show in that little screen shapes what we see of that world. So you, you always have an influence. It does, and I, and I know that we, the two of us can talk about it for, for, for hours, but uh, it's, it's to call uh, with, all, uh, with all your experience, all the sincerity, all the professionals that you have and the media behind you, is to call a spade a spade. Right to call that Ukraine war is actually what the Russian propaganda want. This is not a this is not a Ukraine war. This is a Russian aggression against Ukraine. You're, you're just on that issue, Lubmir, as a politician, do you want to talk about that very quickly? Do you, do you have any views on the media, the way the media is reporting the war, or not? Europe. Oh, Europe, uh, Europe. very yeah. briefly, because then we want to talk about that question. Maybe it's like better to... not to speak about it. But you know, in the past uh, we spoke about the uh, was uh, war propaganda. Today we have strategic communication. The result of strategic communication, though that it's very difficult to know what is really happening now in Ukraine. It's true, because uh, in, in, in the military, they have special term. It is informative uh, measurement, maybe. And uh, generally, politics speak about strategic communication. It really is a big problem, because uh, in time of the war, the main danger, this is, the, the, every war represents big danger for the democracy. Because what we are, now, uh, what we are uh, uh, naming strategic communication means that we have some strategic goals in this communication. It means that it's not about true, it's about strategic communication. We have to, we have to... Uh, uh, it, it's achieve a, an outcome. You're yeah, trying, so, there's an outcome you're trying to achieve yeah, yeah. with the communication. That, yeah. th that's why uh, maybe what it's now what is what is happening in Europe, or also in Czech Republic, represent big test of democracy. Because in war, democracy is in danger. It's true. Now, quickly on that question, and that will be the last comment. Yeah, so, the, 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 are we in danger of populist politics? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. refugees and yeah. so on. I would that. like to say that during France presidency, they were also facing two uh, elections, and uh, I saw that uh, France was, was criticised that because of the election, they were not able to concert, concentrate on some issues. That I saw this criticism of French presidency, that this election really influenced the, the outcome, influenced uh, uh, the, uh, the intensity of uh, uh, French presidency. It's one thing. And second, what will it mean for Czech Republic? No, I'm convinced that uh, some, one thing has to be clear, that for current government, the battlefield, battlefield, the main battlefield is not only Ukraine, the main battlefield is here in Czech Republic. Because if I said that it's our interest to, to play and to, to, to be able to influence European position, because something very important is at stake on Ukraine, then it's important how government, our government will, be com will communicate with people. Very honestly, very frankly, and uh, to explain things, and to, uh, because we are on the brink of recession, the prices are soaring, that it's clear that this autumn will be very difficult. And it's really a test of communication of politicians with people. That's why for government, as I said, it's a main battlefield. We have, we have to create resiliency in our country. It's our role, our task to be resilient, to be able to keep this resiliency. And there is, a, there is a big role of politicians, probably also medias, but politicians in first. And that's why the presidency is big chance, but also big uh, responsibility. And uh, it's only what I can say. Yes, we have two elections, it's nothing extraordinary, but uh, the role of government is to be, to be frank, to be honest, if I compare, for example, the situation in Germany and Austria, I'm afraid it seems to me that current German government is more open to public than Czech government. I don't start to criticize, but it seems to me it is a debt on our side. It would be very important to be able to win this fight here in Czech Republic. Thank you. Well, actually, I would say, you say it's nothing normal, it's nothing routine to have elections. I think we should all remember it's a real privilege to have elections. 40 years ago, you guys didn't have elections. So make sure you vote, that's for sure. Look, um, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Don't clap yet. The next session we're going to be discussing is Africa. And you may say, well, what, what's this got to do with Africa? One of the big issues is going to be the 
food crisis in Africa caused by Ukraine is going to cause millions of more refugees, which Europe is going to have to face. So it's one of the many issues, ways in which what's happening in Ukraine is affecting Africa. The Russians are very active in Africa. The Chinese are Af in Africa. Ukraine is changing things there. We're going to be discussing that with an African expert based here in the Czech Republic. But for now, please join me in saying thank you very much for such a great discussion, uh, my two guests. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>